so much Star Wars goodness. It's Star Wars Celebration Chicago, but we are not done yet. We still have two amazing days of great Star Wars panels, the great show floor. How about The Mandalorian this morning? <laughs> Jedi Fallen Order? <laughs> Episode 9, The Rise of Sky. Well, this hour, you're going to get a chance to hear from one of my favorite people in Star Wars, someone that I've looked up to for a long time, someone whose artwork and direction is absolutely incredible and essential to Star Wars. I'm not going to waste any time. He's going he's gonna to really fill up the hour. But I will say that we will have some time towards the end. If you have any burning questions that you want to ask Doug, we'll do some Q&A at the end. But let's not waste any more time. Please give a warm welcome to Vice President and Executive Creative Director at Lucasfilm, Doug Chang. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out here. I mean, it's such a huge honor for me to be here to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Episode One. Even the <laughs> thanks. Even though we're here to celebrate the 20th anniversary, this year marks 24 years since I've been working on Star Wars. Um, yeah, I know. Makes me feel really old. Um, when I was first hired by George in 1995 to head up the new Star Wars art department, this was the mission that he set out for us. Clever in the first Star Wars films in that I, I kept the design very simple. I vo avoided situations where I was going to get into trouble design-wise. This one, I'm daring to take the chance and see what happens. So that was the new bold vision that he wanted for us. And hearing that terrified me. I grew up with the original trilogy, and I thought I was hired to do more of that classic look. But George had other ideas. Uh, he wanted to start at the beginning. He wanted to build the foundation for all Star Wars designs. We had a huge 32-year gap from episode one to episode four. And today, what I'd like to share with you is what that design process was like, how the design of Star Wars evolved, and I'll also share what it was like to work with George and the lessons that I learned about designing for Star Wars. So this is one of my favorite quotes from Joseph Campbell, and it helped me to take on the challenge that George had set out for us. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasures that you seek. And I've learned to embrace this quote throughout my career. It taught me to see risk uh, as a good thing. And it taught me that failure as an, is, a, is an, a, an opportunity. In retrospect, George's new direction was wonderful. I knew that the designs that we were going to create was going to be slightly different, but the design process was going to be exactly the same. But before I get into that, I want to show you this really fun, timeless um, demo movie that I made a couple weeks ago. Um, I drew this and recorded this uh, when I was thinking about what I want to share with you today. And I wanted to see if I could digitally redraw one of my old marker sketches from one of my favorite drawings of the battle droids from 20 years ago. And I drew this on my iPad. Redrawing one of my old marker drawings digitally has been really tricky. And for the longest time, it never worked for me. It was either the software wasn't right or the tools were too clunky. And, but with the new iPad Pro using the iPad Pencil and a program called Procreate, it all clicked for me about a month or two ago. And it turned out to be amazing. It's a really powerful designing tool. It's so much easier to use. I mean, it really took the pressure out of drawing these drawings. Because before, when I made a mistake, I literally had to throw the drawing away. Uh, now I can just click the undo button. Uh, so this sketch, the, the sketch on the left is the one that I drew in 1995, and the, you know, there's almost exactly 24 years between these two. And a lot has changed for me since then. Uh, for me, I mean, I was just thrilled that I could still draw one of my old drawings very much the same as before. <laughs> but even though a lot has changed for me, the lessons that I learned from George has remained true. Uh, and of course, we can't talk about Star Wars design without talking about Ralph McQuarrie. He, <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, even though Ralph didn't work on episode one and I really wanted him to, I actually met with him early on to try to talk him to coming on board. And in, in his very humble way, he said that he had his turn and it was time for new artists. And I was really disappointed. Um, you know, it's, but even though he didn't work on it, his work is there. It's there in everything that I do. Ralph, 
is and was the grand master of concept design and my personal design hero. Growing up, I learned how to paint by studying his paintings. I grew up with his sketches. Uh, his work heavily influenced myself and others of my generation. Ralph had this amazing sensibility that was Star Wars, and Star Wars was Ralph. Ralph expresses so much with so few strokes, and his economy of design is something that I carry with me today. These are th thumbnail sketches for him, and they're some of my favorites. They're tiny, they're about two by six inches, and yet they convey so much. Each one is a frame that I want to see in a movie. So Ralph designed cinematically, and that is something that's really important. His frequency of detail, if you look at these sketches, the rhythm to his proportions, his use of positive and negative shapes, how he contrasts area of low detail with bands of high detail. All these things are now distinctly Star Wars. But the biggest lesson that I learned from George and Ralph was not to be afraid of creating bold designs. They didn't play it safe. Ralph was 45 when George hired him uh, to work on Star Wars. He was already at the top of his game. By contrast, George hired me, I was 32, and I was relatively new in my career. I had only been working professionally for about nine years, and during those nine years, I had honed my skills, and I could draw pretty well, but I didn't go to art school. I figured if I wanted to get into film design, I should go to film school, so I went to UCLA Film School. Uh, and I learned most of my art on the job, the hard way. So how did I get hired to be head of the art department for the new Star Wars films? You know, why me? Uh, I certainly wasn't the best artist, uh, not by a long shot. Part of that answer can be found in 1989 when I first started working at ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, George Lucas's visual effects company. I was hired for a three-week project. This is the art department, and, and this is my desk here. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I still remember walking from the ILM parking lot and seeing the ILM logo on a door and realizing that this is where Ralph McQuarrie and Joe Johnston worked. Even though Ralph and Joe were no longer there, the art department still had some of the industry's best artists and designers. And I quickly realized, because I didn't go to art school, my skills were lacking. And I knew that if I wanted to stay longer than the three-week project, I had to dramatically improve myself. So as I worked during the day, trying to keep up with everyone, I set a secret goal. For one year, I was going to work at home every night to improve my art skills. During the day, I would do my day job as a visual effects art director for films like Forrest Gump, Terminator 2, Death Becomes Her, and Ghost. Then at night, I would work on my own projects. So this is my desk. It's <laughs> very analog back then, and it's a miracle that I got anything done in that mess. So every day for one year, I gave myself an assignment, something to push myself out of my comfort zone. Then during the weekend, I would complete that assignment, either with a finished painting or a finished concept rendering. And it was really hard, uh, but I knew I had to do it. I had to cut out my social life in order to make this work. And I started by honing my spaceship skills by studying Joe Johnston's work. I studied his line work, his shape language, his forms. I studied how he rendered, and I basically studied how he drew. And I also pushed myself to do costumes and creatures, uh, following Nilo's work from episode six. I experimented with different looks, mixing styles, mixing shapes and cultures, tried different rendering techniques by using colored markers. And I also took on creature design, even though, whoa, <laughs> it's not supposed to be green. <laughs> even though I'm not very good with creatures, I felt that I had to learn in order to be a well-rounded artist. Uh, and I also did a, a series of Sid Mead-like paintings. Besides Ralph, Sid Mead is my other design hero. Uh, the image on the left is an acrylic painting that I made to mimic one of Sid's gouache paintings. And the one on the right is a marker drawing of a transforming jet. Uh, and of course, I did a lot of Ralph McQuarrie-style paintings. I studied his palette, his composition, his designs, everything about him. I wanted to figure out what made Ralph's work so unique. I wanted to capture his style. And slowly, I started to develop my own style, my own aesthetic sensibility, which was combining organic forms with technology. And as I got better, I started to combine my passion for wildlife painting with technology to create interesting combinations. And this was a really important step for me. As an artist and designer, it's important to find your own style, your own voice, something that resonates with you and something that distinguishes you from everybody else. And this became my style, combining nature with technology to create something different. After that year, 
I greatly improved my skills and had a new portfolio. And the timing was perfect. In the summer of 1994, George announced that he was going to make new Star Wars films. And I was thrilled. Uh, here was my chance to work on Star Wars. And I thought being at ILM, his company would give me an advantage. Ironically, it didn't. Um, George actually wanted to look outside the company first. He wanted fresh talent. He wanted to cast the talent net worldwide first. So I got in line and submitted my portfolio blind like everybody else and just waited. Unknown to me at that time, my year of homework, experimenting with styles, mixing genres, uh, combining old and new, uh, was what George was doing with Ralph on the original trilogy. And that's how I got the job. So this is Skywalker Ranch, and the third floor, the attic, was the art department, and that's my office. It was my office for, for the longest time. So on January 15th of 1995, I started working at Skywalker Ranch. And for the next seven years, I worked very closely with George, designing while he wrote. And the days were long. They were typically 10 to 12 hours days, sometimes longer. Those hours weren't set by George. They were set by me because I was, you know, I, I just felt a lot of pressure. And first, I wanted to prove to George that he hadn't made a mistake in hiring me. I mean, I was completely suffering from the classic imposter syndrome. And second, I wanted to try to live up to Ralph's legacy. I wanted to not let the fans down. And a lot of people ask me, you know, well, what was it like working with George? And to be honest, I mean, it was absolutely terrifying. Terr <laughs> terrifying because on the very first day, he said, forget about what I thought Star Wars design is. He wanted to start at the beginning. He wanted to lay down the foundation, you know, figuring everything out from episode one all the way even to episode six. And at that time, I was so prepared to do original trilogy designs that I didn't know where to start. I felt like for years I've been cramming and preparing for the wrong test. Uh, and the first art reviews were scary. I'm normally a very quiet person, and so is George. So the first art reviews were filled with intense silence. <laughs> I, I was so afraid to ask any questions. Finally, George suggested that we make stamps for approvals. And I thought that was brilliant. So we made three stamps. Uh, we had one that was deep regret, and that was for ideas that were bad. And there was one for OK if the ideas were going in the right direction, and then Fabuloso for ideas that are approved. Needless to say, it took me forever to get the coveted Fabuloso stamp. The sheer amount of work that first year was overwhelming because we were designing three films at the same time. And the art department that first year was just myself and Tara Whitlatch. And Tara, if you know her work, she's an amazing creature artist, probably one of the best, if not the best, working in the industry. So she took on all the creature work, and I took on the rest. And I broke down my work into manageable pieces by setting daily goals. I aimed to do three to five of these sketches uh, every day, aiming for about 25 a week. And I did this for two reasons. Uh, the first was to force myself to keep moving so I didn't overwork a design. I wouldn't go home until my daily goal was met, and that's why sometimes my days were longer than 12 hours. The actual drawing part wasn't that hard. Getting the idea was. The second was to give myself a box to work within. I believe the best designs are created when you're given limitations. And since George didn't give me one, I gave one to myself. In art, the amount of time you spend on a piece doesn't determine how good it is. Often it's the opposite. And this graph shows that law of diminishing returns. And there's a lot of truth to this. Now, when I find myself struggling with a design and I'm spending too much time on it, I know it's probably better to throw it away and move on it usually means that I'm trying to save a bad idea. A great example of this is the design of the Millennium Falcon. Because of a last minute change, Joe had to redesign the Falcon. And the new design came together quickly from only a couple of sketches. And to this day, the Falcon is still one of the best designs in Star Wars. So despite all that stress, I mean, that first year was amazing in hindsight. Uh, I look back on those days uh, with a lot of fondness, even if I didn't quite enjoy it at that time. Skywalker Ranch was my first true art and film school, and I was really lucky to have George as my instructor. George has an incredibly keen eye and an exquisite taste in art and design. Uh, but he didn't teach me how to draw. He taught me how to design. And how to design for Star Wars was critical. I often hear today in a lot of our art review meetings, well, that's Star Wars, or that's not Star Wars. And it's always interesting to hear what other people think is Star Wars. George taught me that Star Wars design is about bold design. Think about the original TIE Fighter. 
or Slave One, or even the cloud cars, it's easy to forget that George took a lot of risks. If you were to, for example, only look at the designs from episode four, you wouldn't have designed Cloud City, or the AT-ATs, or even Java's barge. And yet, all those designs are distinctly Star Wars. They were unexpected, they were fresh, and they were bold statements at that time. And I also learned, you know, what is Star Wars is what George says is Star Wars. <laughs> uh, during that first year, we came up with aesthetic themes that would guide us for episode one. George wanted to use Art Nouveau as the underlying foundation, the style guy for Nubu. I turned to African art for the droid army and, and, the, and the vehicles. We both liked elegant and sleek designs, calling back to the sleek, streamlined automotives of the 1950s. George wanted to try bold colors as well. He wanted bright yellows and reds to contrast the subdued colors that he had used for the original trilogy, which was mostly black and gray with little accents of red. Uh, but the big breakthrough for me, however, was to understand that the designs that we were creating was going to mirror our own design history, going from the handcrafted romantic designs of the 1920s and 30s to the more manufactured look of the 1970s. And that's what allows these two very different ship aesthetics to exist in the same universe. And so here's the style difference between episode 1s and episode 4. You know, the sleek look of the N1 Starfighter was influenced by the Cadillac Cyclone and the Firebird concept car. And the Y-Wing and the Blockade Runner then became aesthetically more like the cars from the 1970s, like the Ford Torino or the Dodge Charger. Or even more graphically, in locomotive terms, this is what the stylistic difference 30 years can make, going from the streamlined era of the 1930s to the heavier, angular lines of the 1970s. This design timeline anchored our designs in reality and gave me a solid framework to work with. And this was really important, because George never considered Star Wars science fiction. He always considered it a period film. So we were going to design and approach episode one like a period film. These are the five rules that I came up with while working with George, and I won't go into too much detail here, but the first two are the most important. When you design, you design for the silhouette. You design for the shape. You design for the logo, you know, or essentially the icon of, of what that shape is. And the second one, the three-second rule, uh, was a huge eye-opener for me. I mean, it completely transformed how I design now. And it happened one day when I was showing George a whole bunch of designs, and I presented a wall full. And very quickly, in a matter of seconds, he picked out the you know, one or two that he liked. And I finally had the courage to ask him, well, why did you pick that? And he said, well, Doug, you know, I don't understand these other drawings. And you're not going to be in the audience to explain these to the audience. They're only going to see it for a couple of seconds. And if they can't figure out what its purpose is, where the pilot sits, which way it's going, what it's supposed to do, then it doesn't work. So it's a brilliant way of looking at at sort of design, and I now use a little trick. So every time when I come up with a design that I think works, I try to redraw it in seconds. And if I can't, that probably means that it's too complicated and it's probably not as good as I thought it was. So getting started, step one, finding the idea. Uh, one of the first lessons that I learned from George was never design in a vacuum. Always use research. Don't be afraid to use references as inspiration. It's a matter of looking at common objects in an uncommon way. Mix and match to turn something ordinary into something extraordinary. For example, the dragster was the initial inspiration for the X-Wing. And as you can see in this early Colin Catwell prototype model, the nose is painted like a dragster. Or how the unique street lamps in Northern California inspired Slave One. And the key to understand is not about copying your inspiration, but it's how you interpret it. It's how you see and use research. Remember, it's your choices that determine your talent. For me, I use pterosaurs to inspire the starfighter droids, or tall ships to inspire the bridge for the Federation battleships, or how I use the SR-71 spy plane for the queen ship. I mean, all I did was move the cockpit to the back and painted it chrome. <laughs> um, when you do that, what happens is that your design carries with it all the history of your source material, and it makes them authentic. It grounds them in reality. So the first day, getting the bad ideas out. My first day was really intense. Uh, the, the, the week prior, George gave me a long list of things to do, and the list was completely overwhelming. Right? It was over five pages long. Uh, there were three new planets to do, two new cultures, tons of vehicles, characters, and creatures, and then three major action set pieces that he wanted to figure out. 
And this was on top of figuring out what the new aesthetic style should be. So my goal was to get all the bad ideas out so the good ones would pop up. <laughs> I mean, not really, but that's kind of what happened. Um, so this is my very first drawing uh, on my very first day, January 15, right here, <laughs> 1995. George had asked for a new stormtrooper. He said, let's make a robotic stormtrooper. And in a classic rookie designer move, I took that literally, and it was completely wrong. But instead of getting discouraged, I decided to embrace my rejections and created a wall of shame. <laughs> which is there, filled with all my reject ideas. And I started to look at my failures as a good thing, as a sign of progress. I figured by seeing what George didn't like, I was getting closer to what he liked. That wall got filled very quickly the very first year. And when Ray Harryhausen came to visit, the very first thing I showed him um, were my rejects. So I took a page from George and started to use research. Uh, I found this wonderful book on African sculptures. The stylization of African art gave me ideas to try different proportions for the droids. And this is where the elongated head came from. And George also insisted that the designs not look like a guy in a suit, like C-3PO. He wanted to try something that was very abstract. Um, and that opened up a whole world of possibilities. African sculptures are amazingly beautiful. I love the proportions in the stylization. And I even tried one that was really tall to keep those proportions. And by the way, Originally, I had a much darker concept of what the battle droids were going to be. I thought they would be mute uh, to make them mysterious and deadly. And I also thought that, you know, that they should be really scary. So that's why I made them very thin and white, so they look like skeletons. Uh, and I also wanted the droids to look like their makers, their builders, as if they made the droids to look like them. So the original Nemoidians had very long heads as well. When that concept of the Nemoidians later changed, we kept the long heads and kept them and used them for the Geonosians in episode two. Uh, and I really wanted to get, uh, give the droids jetpacks because I thought you know, they'd be really cool flying around. <laughs> that idea <laughs> didn't wor work for George, so the jetpacks just became your regular utility backpack. But I still wanted the droids to fly. And so I just thought, OK, how about flying speeders? And I thought it might be kind of cool to try choppers, motorcycle choppers, like a Harley Davidson style version instead of the version that you saw on Endor. That didn't quite work, but the idea stuck and eventually became Darth Maul's speeder. So sometimes bad ideas can be transformed into good ones later on. As I explored more with the speeders, the idea of looking at a jet ski really was interesting to me. I love the upright configuration. And it created a, an interesting silhouette that was, that was kind of unexpected. But the idea really clicked for me when I started to connect the concept with a hummingbird. It's not literally a hummingbird, but a stylized interpretation. The heads became the guns, and the wings became platforms for the droids to stand on. And this is one of my favorite production paintings for episode one. I thought the droids would buzz around the forest like giant prehistoric hummingbirds. And I imagined you know, that the, both the sound and the sight of them would be terrifying. Here's our 1 8 scale concept model built in the art tournament to figure out the final proportions and the final texture. And at this time, the droids were still white. They didn't become tan until about a year later. Uh, at the same time, George was also asking for another droid that was even more odd, something completely robotic. So I started to explore the idea of, OK, how about a walking tripod with guns? Then I remembered seeing this wonderful documentary about wheel spiders in Namibia how they would tuck up their legs and they would roll down the sand dunes. And I thought, wow, it might be cool if these droids actually rolled. And then I was in the, the Air Museum one weekend, and I saw this concept for the ejection seat. And I really liked how the articulate shields kind of fold up. And I thought, OK, well, that's kind of cool. How about if I put those onto the battle droids and had them roll up? And George really liked the idea, but he found this image too complicated. He couldn't easily see how this transformed into that, even though I was very careful about trying to figure that out. But this broke the three-second rule. I had to explain it to him. So I decided to make it graphically simple. I went with a pill bug, and I curved the back so you could easily understand that it would tuck into a wheel. Uh, and by the way, I never meant for these droids to walk. I always thought they would roll, unfold, and then stand like a tripod. And so that's why I gave them three legs. Later on in post, when George decided that he wanted them to walk, I got a lot of grief from the animators because they had trouble animating with three legs. Uh, oops, let me go back one. 
So here is our 8-inch cardboard study model to work out the proportions. So it's very helpful once the design is finished to work out the, the mechanics of it, because I want to make these designs believable so that there's very little cheating. Uh, the image on the right is our six-foot full-size practical build that we took out on set for reference. And you'll notice that it's painted to look like the, a hot muffler with all the iridescent color. And that was because I wanted to subliminally suggest that it was hot and dangerous, that you shouldn't touch it. And if you can build those things into the design, it just makes the design that much better. And here's the, um, some ideas for the droid landing ships. I chased this design for quite a while uh, until I found this reference of a, of a folding anchor an old folding anchor. And I liked how it unfolded, and it gave me the idea that, okay, well, maybe the landing ship could unfold, kind of like a bird stretching its wing when it's coming in for a landing. And so I really liked where this was going. And I decided, okay, well, how about if I give it a little bit of a personality? And I doubled the wings and gave it the dragonfly proportions. And this was starting to work really well. It was easy, simple to understand, and it had personality. Then I thought, okay, well, how about if I simplify it even more? Well, let's just remove the tail. In design, once you come up with something that works, it's always a good idea to try starting to remove elements until it doesn't work anymore. And then you put that last piece back, and that way you'll know you, have, you will have the absolute simplest solution. After removing the tail, the, um, the landing ship became more graphic. It became a giant H, which worked really well. And George liked the idea. But in seeing, instead of seeing a dragonfly, George thought it looked like a World War I biplane which I thought was even better, because he had connected it with something that was historical, and it grounded the design in reality. Here's our one and a half inch styrene study model to work out the proportions. It's always important to make a little study model so you can actually see the designs in 3D. We used to make them out of styrene or sometimes even cardboard. Today, we now 3D print them. And here's a 10-foot shooting model in progress being built in the island model shop. And this is the close-up of the cargo door of the landing foot of the transport. I wanted to make it look like a foot that kind of opened up into a mouth. And here's the finished model being lit. It was a beautiful model. And unfortunately, you only see it in a couple of shots. And that's the heartbreak of what we do. Uh, we design and build so many cool designs, and they're only seen in a handful of shots. Thankfully, we now have video games like Battlefront 2 to enjoy them more. Uh, <laughs> And here's that same model in the hangar of the Federation battleship. So this was another huge miniature setup, big enough to fit the, the full-size landing ship in there. And you'll notice that there are these tiny little droid transports here, the MTTs. We used to call the MTTs Tootsie Rolls because they look like Tootsie Rolls next to the landing ship. But in reality, the MTTs were actually quite large. They're about four feet long. And the armor assault tank, the AATs, was an interesting challenge. George's design brief for this was really simple. He said, let's just design a floating tank. So I explored a couple different configurations, and all these weren't working. They were visually confusing. They didn't look like tanks, and they were hard to understand. Even though I personally like these designs, you couldn't tell front from back. So these broke the three-second rule and the silhouette rule. Then I remember George describing a moment where he wanted the AATs to be cutting through trees like a knife. And I thought, okay, well, maybe the front should be sharp, like a shovel spade. So I used the shovel spade, flipped it upside down, and added a turret, and suddenly it started to work. It was simple, it was easy to understand, and it looked like a flying tank. This is the pencil sketch that I did for the production painting of the AAT. Uh, for production paintings, what I'll normally do is, once I have an idea, I'll do a very detailed line drawing first, and then transfer that onto the illustration board before I start painting in acrylics. Once I do that, I'll actually do a very small acrylic painting study. And this is about one by two inches. And they take about an hour to do, but it's, it's really helpful because I can explore different colors and different palettes. Uh, and then, you know, you know, since they're very, sh they don't take very long, I can throw them away if they don't work. And I decided to paint the tank yellow because I thought it looked good against the green grass and the color just stuck. And here's the finished production painting. It's about 7 by 14 inches, painted in acrylic. And at this time, you'll notice I had the tanks flying through the air like airplanes. Um, George thought it'd be better if we just kept them on the ground to make them more menacing. Uh, and here's our large-scale shooting model in progress. The small one down in here, this is the art department concept model. And then the, the image on the, uh, on the right uh, shows uh, visual effects supervisor Dennis Murin on the left and model supervisor Steve Gawley um, behind the tank. 
And for me, it was actually very surreal to be working with both of them on episode one, because the first time I saw them was when I was 15 years old, watching them on the Making Of documentary for episode four. And we made several versions of the destroyed version of the tank as well. So this is what happens to the poor droids inside the tanks when they're shot by Padme's army. And here's our full-size tank in progress being carved out of foam in our studios in Leavesden. For the Queen's Palace, we scouted several locations. We went to Venice, we went to Spain, Istanbul, to try to find the right architectural style for it. And we finally landed on this famous mosque, Hagia Sophia in Turkey. And that became the foundation for the palace. And here's the final design of the palace. This painting captured the old world romantic look that George wanted. And I added the waterfalls to give it a magical quality to make it look more like a Maxfield Parrish painting, which I knew George was really fond of. And that explains why the colors are so rich. The design of the city evolved from this one painting. From there, we laid out the entire city. We created a very detailed city model. And the reason we did this was George had a very specific idea of where action should take place. And so we had to stage it, and we had to figure out you know, all the geography of, you know, can our heroes go from here to here in time? And so in this model here, this is the palace, the hangar's over here, and this is the big generator room where Darth Maul had his fight with our heroes. Because the city was a mix of different styles, we couldn't shoot on location. And we ended up building a, 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 a dozens of large-scale miniature buildings to make up the city that would augment our sort of full-size partial set builds. And the models were built to look different on each side so that we could rotate them and then we can come up with different street layouts based on the different looks. So it became this giant modular puzzle. Then we would reconfigure them to the shots that we want based on the map. And here's a setup for one of the riverside streets approaching the palace. The blue would be replaced later with real water. And here's the full outdoor set uh, with all of our modular buildings. And this was shot in the dirt parking lot behind ILM, just so that we can get the natural light. And here's the entrance to the palace. So it's a very elaborate model. And here it is in the, in the final shot. So all of this, as you saw, up to about here, was miniature, and then we added digital map painting and digital uh, ships flying in, this, in the sky. So let's talk pod racers. This is probably one of my favorite sequences from episode one. Uh, during our first design meeting, George described a new racing vehicle. He said, take two rocket engines and strap a cockpit to it. And I thought, oh wow, that's fantastic. I love what I was hearing. But my first reaction then was to ground it in practicality. I thought, okay, well the engines should be connected together because Otherwise, you couldn't fly it, thinking that it would be you know, too squirrely. And I didn't realize that was the whole point of what he wanted. So I tried a whole bunch of different ideas, and he kept saying the same thing. No, just take two engines and strap a cockpit to it. Think of it like a horse and chariot. But somehow, even though I was hearing those words, I couldn't get, it out of, you know, <laughs> get my head around it. So I chased this for weeks. I kept tying the engines together. My logical brain just wouldn't let me do it. Finally, I took a research trip to the maintenance bay at San Francisco airport, and I saw these giant engines hung from overhead cranes, and they were just amazing. I mean, you, I realized you don't have to do too much. You just take these out to the desert, and there it is. <laughs> it only took me 283 drawings to get to this point. <laughs> uh, and that's the great lesson to learn, is that you don't have to change things that much to make them fantastic. You just put it into a new context. And I was always amazed that George had this amazing ability to do this quickly. Uh, he could see ordinary things in extraordinary ways. Once the concept was clear to me, I started to design various engine configurations, keeping that horse and chariot motif, coming up with different silhouettes. From there, we made a bunch of very simple cardboard models so George could look at them in 3D and, and decide you know, which ones looked the best from different angles. Because the race was going to be very kinetic, it was important that clarity of form was, was easy to see. We also kitbashed a bunch of cockpit designs for George, so he can then pick and, ma pick and <laughs> match, um, mix and match, I mean, the different cockpits with the engines. And it was a really great way of just creating a bunch of variety. And this is our complete lineup with our graphic color treatments to enhance their readability. George always wanted them to be painted like F1 racing cars, and that's where the sound design made them sound more like cars than jets. This was the original model for Anakin's pod racer. George wanted Anakin to have the simplest, almost the most boring racer. Uh, 
And then later, he decided to make Anakin's engines even smaller. He thought it would make him look more like an underdog. And I added the maneuvering flaps because I want uh, people to visibly see how Anakin was flying this. And I did that also because I really liked the flaps from the snow speeders from Empire Strikes Back. And here is the finished acrylic painting. Uh, and this captured the drama and the spectacle of the race. And it was, for me, it was really fun to paint. Uh, by the way, we took a lot of time to figure out the perfect distance between engine to engine and engine to cockpit. What well, we realized that if it was too far or too close, the, the design didn't work. And it's a very subtle thing, but it's part of the homework that we have to do to get the designs right. Later, George wanted to give Anakin's copy a little bit more personality, and he suggested that we reference his, one of his favorite cars, the 1963 Birdcage Maserati. And I thought that was fantastic, because I love that car as well. And the addition of the front fenders ended up framing Anakin really nicely in the shots. And plus, it also made mechanical sense, because it gave protection for, uh, from him from the cables. Here's our eight scale model built for lighting reference. We actually built detailed models of all of our hero pod racers. And that was for two reasons. One, we were going to use them as actual uh, paint and, and model de references for the CG versions. But then we also used them for our full-size practical builds as well. Some people have asked me if Hannigan's engines <laughs> were actually inspired by RCA stereo cables. Uh, sadly, that would have made for a great story, but it's not true. <laughs> The truth is that they were based on a design I had made a couple years earlier while working at, at ILM for an airline commercial. I designed these flying elevators with folding wings, and I always liked the design, so I stole them back for myself. Uh, here's our eight scale model of the pot hanger. This was a huge miniature and, and one of my favorite sets. This was about 60 feet long, and I love this set. Um, I spent many hours dressing this set. I would, you know, climb around it, kind of like a kid in the best play yard or play set. And here we are putting our finishing touches on the model. We would dress the model to the camera shot by shot. And then as a finishing touch, we would smoke up the set to give it atmosphere and scale. But I learned a lot about miniature photography from Steve Gawley, the model supervisor. Dressing the miniature was not about building reality. It was about creating the illusion of reality. And what I mean by that is that you're giving an impression to the camera. And for example, when we were uh, addressing this, I wanted to go in there and I wanted to put bird droppings on, on, the, on parts of the, the model because I thought that would give it a little level of realism. So I went in there and started to paint these tiny little dots to scale. And Steve said, no, 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 the camera will never see that. And he started to paint these huge blobs. And I was freaking out because in scale, those bird droppings would have been the size of dinner plates. <laughs> but the next day in dailies, it looked absolutely convincing. The camera picked it up enough so that it gave that illusion. And that's why I realized it's all a trick. Um, this was the approved uh, sketch for the Pod Arena. And the design came together very quickly. I drew this only in a couple of sketches. And then we went right to a concept model. This was a very detailed model built out of styrene. It was about three feet wide. And it was built by John Goodson, one of our uh, concept art, art modelers. And from there, we used that concept model as a guide to build our huge shooting miniatures. And our miniatures were big. We used to call them bigatures because they were not miniatures. And here's Marty Rosenberg and myself. Uh, Marty was the miniature director of photography. And we're talking about the best position to angle the, uh, the, the set to the light, to the sun. Because we had to figure it out in advance, because once we set up the model, it was almost impossible to move. And the arena was one of our biggest sets. The platform itself was about 60 by 70 feet. And again, this was in the back dirt parking lot behind ILM. And here's the finished shot of the pot arena. And to this day, it's still one of my favorite moments. For the crowds uh, for the arena, we couldn't fill them all with digital characters. So John Noel, the visual effects supervisor on this, came up with a brilliant solution. He thought, well, let's paint hundreds, if not thousands, of Q-tips, different colors, and then place them through screens. And then we would place a fan underneath and blow it. And that would cause them to wobble a little bit. So from a distance, they look like tiny figures. And it worked really well. I mean, here's the crowd full of Q-tips. Yeah, that's a lot of Q-tips. <laughs> but you know, it was just enough. And again, the miniatures are, it's all about creating the illusion of reality. Um, and a lot of the environments for the pod race were all miniatures. I mean, a lot of people think they're digital, but it's not. So this is Beggar's Canyon. And in the upper right here, this is another setup for another part of the pod race. And then beyond that is actually San Francisco Bay. 
So episode one was Island's biggest miniature film ever, more than the original trilogy, more than any other film that they've worked on since. And people often forget that. They think it's all digital. But computer graphics at this time, 1998, 99, was still really hard. So most of the backgrounds and ships were all models. And they were the biggest, some of the biggest that we did. By comparison, the original Star Destroyer for the opening shot of episode four was only three feet long. Our models were nine foot. And here's the finished shot of that model. And we also built a large-scale model of the Republic cruiser, complete with motorized landing gear that actually worked and extended so you could actually land this. And this is the miniature hallway that we built for the interiors of the battleship. And so these were all modular puzzle pieces, again, so that we could extend the partial sets that we built over in Leavesden of the full-size hallways. And even the Nebu jungles were all miniatures. And this was built inside one of our largest interior uh, sound stages at ILM. And we simulated water by just using Miraplex. Uh, this was my last production painting for episode one. Several months before the release of the film, George asked for one final painting of Darth Maul. And of course, I love Darth Maul. Uh, so this was my last piece of art for episode one. By this time, I was spending most of my days back at ILM working with them to finish the visual effects. And this is a true story. I caught George in between buildings, and he approved this painting in the parking lot, the same parking lot that I parked 10 years earlier to start working at ILM. So for me, this painting means a lot to me because I felt like I had come full circle in my design journey for episode one. And now I've been designing films for over 35 years. Those seven years with George are still the best. Ralph had set the bar over 40 years ago, and we've been trying to meet it ever since. This is my work setup today. Um, right here. This was back then, so 20 years later. It's a little bit more high-tech, <laughs> but how I design is still exactly the same. On the other side of my office, I still have a drafting table with pencil and marker. And I never take what I do for granted. I feel really lucky that I get to do this every day, and I still treat every day as if it's my first day on the job. Little has changed in my work habits. Uh, my days are still long. I wake up at 5, and I get in the office by 6.30. And I feel very thankful that I can still learn something at my age. I'm 57 now. And it's, it's a very challenging job, but it's also one that's really fulfilling. George's lesson from over 24 years ago still resonate with me. Those five rules still inform how I design today, even for non-Star Wars projects. And I'm really proud of the work that we did on episode one. Working with George was an, truly an unforgettable experience. And I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to help him realize his vision. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Doug Chang, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Give it up for Doug Chang. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to interrupt this. This is no, great. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. This, this means so much to me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're very fortunate because we still have time for you to ask Doug questions right here at Celebration. And why don't we go ahead and start, where should we start? Right here. Hi, uh, my name's Kelly, I'm from Pennsylvania. And I was just wondering what it's like going from being sort of the new guy and sort of, you know, learning from Ralph, Ralph McQuarrie to now being the new Ralph McQuarrie, basically. Well, oh. And what that's been like for you. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't consider myself that, but I, I'm, I'm truly honored that you do. No, it's, it's really interesting because, um, this industry is really tricky in the sense that you're always judged by your last piece of work or your last film. And so even though you would think that at this point in my career, I would be able to relax a little bit, I always feel like it is like starting over on every project that I'm on. And so I learned a lot from Ralph. And you know, to be honest, when I spoke with Ralph, he felt the same way. I mean, he's truly incredible in the sense that he didn't realize the contribution that he 
you know, gave to George and, and how he transformed all the young designers. And so for me, I just try to live up to that sort of, you know, as a role model. And so w when you say that, I mean, I, I'm, thank you. I, I really <laughs> appreciate that, but I don't think I'm that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, uh, Alex from Maine. Um, with all the practical miniatures, I was wondering if you guys might ever do something with stop motion. Oh, yes. No, you know, it's interesting you say that because I see the pendulum swinging back because for the longest time, when I started at the ILM, it was 1989, all the visual effects were heavily, you know, in, in miniatures and puppets and stop motion. And then as digital came about, the pendulum swung over to all digital and everybody wanted digital. But now I'm seeing that coming back. And it's interesting that you ask that because that's one of the sort of nostalgic things that myself um, feel in, in terms of, you know, and maybe it's just me. I think you'd have to ask the younger generation, but I, there's a glamour to it, and I love the look of stop motion. And we always try that. Every film that I've worked on since, we always talk about, okay, well, should we do this because we're all of the same generation? And we always do the budget math, and it never works out because it's always too expensive. But I, you know, we're still trying. <laughs> right here. Oh. Hey, my name is Matthew Rushing. Um, you were talking about the idea of George really pushing you and saying, just go crazy. And so I'm wondering, what was the design that you brought to him and you thought, this is, this is too much? And he was like, nope, perfect. Oh, wow. <laughs> there were quite a few. I mean, it, it was interesting because I didn't know um, how far he wanted to go with sort of the streamlined look. Uh, I remember the very first time he said, you know what, let's, let's make something very shiny. I, that completely, it was like he said it and it went right through my head because I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing because I always thought, you know, Star Wars was about gritty looking angular ships. And so the first thing was when we designed the, um, the Naboo Starfighter, I mean, that, I, I stuck my neck out there thinking, okay, well, this might be pushing the envelope too far. And he actually pushed it further. Originally, it was just going to be white. And he said, no, let's make it chrome and yellow, bright yellow, like a racing car. And it was one of those things where I realized, you know, George is, was thinking on a different plane. He was really elevating designs even further. And even though he may not have seen it the very first day, he kind of saw it instinctively in his head. And that's where I really got to trust where he was going with this. And, and you know, me, for myself as a designer, I want to try to, you know, push the aesthetic as far as I can, try to do my job in terms of why he hired me. And it was really great to have George always keep pushing me further than I thought. And it's wonderful to work with somebody like that. Thank you. Thank you. Right here, please. Nice. Amazing work for one thing. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, what is your current project right now? What's that? What is your current project? Oh, and all these films. I'm working on the theme parks, the video games, the films, The Mandalorian. <laughs> thank you. Right here, please. Hi, Doug. Uh, you're Presentations are always fascinating and insightful. Thank you. Uh, wondering about your inspirations for Gungan Biotech, uh, places like Otagunga or mm -hmm. things like Bongo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that actually came from George, and it was interesting because when he we were designing the the Gungan city underwater, uh, George was very specific. He wanted it to look like a glowing chandelier underwater. And at first, I mean, again, as a young designer at that time, I was trying to put some logic to it, thinking, okay, well, these are giant spheres. Are they made out of glass? How does it actually hold up with the pressure? I mean, I was way overthinking it. And George just kept saying, no, don't worry about that. We're going for the visual look. It has to be magical. And this is where he was already thinking like five steps ahead because he wanted a force fuel for the end battle, and he was setting it up early. And so that's where he said, you know what, the Gungans have an exotic technology that the, you know, the people on the surface don't have, which is this force field technology. And that informed pretty much the whole design of that city. And so it's, it's a great way where, as a, as a designer, I'm trying to help inform and sort of supply George with the visual ideas that he's putting on paper. But he's already, I realize, he's always been thinking far ahead of me. Great, thank you. Thank you. That was great. Right here, please. Hi. Um, it's really nice that you're here. and. Um, Obviously, in the uh, panel, you uh, highlighted how The Phantom Menace was produced when we were transitioning from analog to digital. And I wanted to know what the upsides and the downsides were to that. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I mean, when you think about it, whether it's analog or digital, it doesn't really matter because they're both tools and techniques. Uh, for me, it's really about finding the best solution for the answer. And it's the same way I approach art. You know, whether I paint something digitally or I do it traditionally, it doesn't really matter because it's just a tool. And one doesn't make the other better. At the end, the core work has to stand on its own. And right now, 
uh, we are going through that phase where there's a falseness to computer graphics uh, that sometimes is easier to see because it's, it, it pushes that reality envelope too far out because sometimes the images that it can create are so fantastic that your brain automatically tells you that it's false. But on the other hand, if you do it as a miniature, you know that there's an inherent quality because it's a physical thing. And so we try to capture that fine line of, okay, we don't sort of betray that um, uh, disbelief of, of, uh, of, of reality in terms of filmmaking. And so for us right now, we're, I, I think we're at a really interesting stage in filmmaking where there is going to be that pendulum is going to swing back and it's going to find that perfect sweet spot of how much digital versus how much practical versus whether or not stop motion comes back or if it's more you know, all CG creature designs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so one part of Phantom Menace that always was really powerful to me was the, the big tall gates at the end of Duel of Fates. Um, and I was wondering if you had any inspiration or insight into how that was uh, designed or inspired. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that was a really good design challenge because George uh, wanted very specific timings for actions. And the set was actually timed based on the beats that he needed to portray what that fight was going to be. And it, in some ways, it was actually interesting to kind of start design that way because the designs actually followed the story requirements. And we went big with it because we wanted to create a lot of drama. And afterwards, we kind of went back and figured out, okay, well, how does this big generator room with all these tall doors and these shields work? And how does that fit into the hangar itself? And it was an interesting design challenge in the sense that George wanted a real strong visual distinction. And this is something that's key for designing for these films is that the environments can get very rich, but if you don't have them be very distinguished, you can't tell where they are and you can't see a progression in terms of the storyline or the fight. And so George was very smart in that he had the fight start in the hangar, and as you progress, the, it's, it opened up into this gigantic space, and then it started to narrow down. But you could logically see where it was going. And so those tall doors were a reflection of that really tall generator room. And you notice we never looked down, because I didn't know how far it went down. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Doug. Hey. It's, uh, it's great to be able to finally talk, talk to you. So, so I've, I've, <laughs> Thank you. I've, I loved all, all the designs you did for episode one. I was going to art school at the time back in 20 years ago. But one design I really loved was Sebulba's pod racer with the, with the massive engines. And <laughs> I was always curious if there was a, a story to how you came to, uh, to, to make the scum of the galaxy's uh, mm -hmm. massive orange and black pod <laughs> racer. Yeah, no, there is actually a really good story for that because um, we knew that Sapovo was going to be the villain in the pod race, and so I wanted to give him the most powerful engine. And the original design was actually a shape of a V, like a V8 engine, to kind of like give it you know, a, an old muscle car personality. And we did a, um, a little prototype model where it was shaped like two V8 engines. And George said, okay, that's a really good idea. But then right away, he turned them 90 degrees and turned them into the X. And I thought that was even better because it, it kept the initial inspiration, but it made it graphically even stronger. Um, so that was one story. And then the color was, of course, because he just wanted bold colors. And Sebulba's uh, pod racer, I think, is one of the best designs of the pod racer because it, it kind of captures all the elements. I mean, it captures the personality that George wanted, but it also fit the design brief for the story. Thank you. Thank you. Right over here. Um, I had a question about the beasts of burden in episode one. Um, like the like the Famba and the mm -hmm. Eobi and things like that. So how how did the how did the designs of the beasts and the things that they carried influence each other? Yeah, it was a little bit of both. I mean, Terrell Whitlatch did you know most of that, if not all of that, and it was great because if there was ever a creature that I needed in the, in the pod race arena, for example, or even on the Nebu jungle, I would give it to her, and she would come back with a beautiful creature, and then I could easily just adapt that into it. So she was kind of in charge of all that, but it, it's kind of it goes hand in hand, and that's where. Art departments, ideally, if it works really well, everybody is kind of working as one team versus an individual artist. Uh, and so currently, like for, for example, and the teams that I put together for the films that I'm working on now, everybody works on multiple pieces. And it's a real blend of you know, whoever's a, let's say, an, an expert at a certain character or creature versus somebody who's really good at spaceships. I have them work together, and you get the best combination of both. Yeah, that, that's great. I also noticed that the Infinity War final battle bear a strong resemblance to the Phantom Venice final battle. I don't know if they, they gave you any credit for that, but I feel like it did influence it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Right over thank here, you. please. Hi, I'm Karen from Miami, and you had 
I've spoken how you had done these designs for the Phantom Menace that were super cool, but like you thought they were only maybe for this film. How was it coming back when you saw these designs maybe in 3D for like the Clone Wars show or seeing them yeah. in the video games? How did you feel about it? Yeah, no, it was actually really heartwarming because, you know, as you know, we design hundreds if not thousands of these designs and, and you're only seeing like a small percentage and there's a huge catalog of designs that are still very strong, but they just didn't fit the story anymore. And so when I left uh, Lucasfilm, you know, for 11 years to go do my own thing, when I came back, it was so heartwarming to see that Dave Filoni had actually taken a lot of the old ideas that weren't ever used, and he started to use them in Rebels and Clone Wars. And, you know, and it was great to just see that they had another life and that they were still being carried on. And what's wonderful now is that we're at a point where we're seeing everything as an entire, in its entirety. So we're taking all those designs, updating them, because we're trying to create one cohesive timeline. And that homework that we did, uh, that George had established in terms of, you know, figuring it out from episode one all the way now through episode nine, there is a logic to it. And I think it's really great for me and it's personally fulfilling as a designer to see that all those designs are now coming to fruition. I really love seeing that expansion of, like, how we now get to see all of this work that you've done. So thank you so much for that. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Right here, please. Hey, I'm Jamie from Austin. Uh, I just wanted to ask what you think the strangest or most outside the box note George ever gave you on a piece was? <laughs> it's, uh, I, I may have told the story before, but it's Watto. Uh, he actually, it, it, this is where he shocked me uh, because we were chasing this and he, had, he saw something in his mind early on and he just kept describing the same thing. So early on in my first year, I painted this portrait of a, of a trader baron that eventually became the Nemordians, but it had Watto's face. Uh, but it did not his body. And he always liked that portrait, but he didn't quite know where it would fit in. And he came in the art department one day and he said, okay, you remember that portrait? Let's take that portrait, put it on a duck, you know, on a uh, sort of a duck body, give it duck feet and bat wings. And, and when I heard those words, it was kind of like, are, are you serious? Is this what you really want? So again, you know, myself, Ian McKegg and Terrell Whitlatch, you know, we're, we're trying to be really logical and say, okay, we heard what he said, but l let's try to interpret it as designers. And so we drew a whole bunch of different things, some really good interpretations of that fit those words. And it was never right. And George just kept saying, no, 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 no. And then finally I just said, okay, I'm gonna do exactly what he's asked for. And I literally did that. I took the head, stuck it on a fat body, added duck feet and wings. And you know what, it worked. It was, it, it totally worked. And, and Waddle was one of my favorite characters. And this is where, I was so impressed that George saw this already in his mind, even if he couldn't physically draw it himself. He had this in his mind, and, and it's one of those things where I learned to appreciate so much of how far he was willing to push the boundaries to create a very memorable character, because I certainly wouldn't have done that. Thank you. So great. <laughs> that was amazing. Right here, please. Hi, I'm Phil from right here in Chicago. Uh, and I have a question about the Essential Guide to Diesels and Vessels. Uh, that was one of my favorite books growing <laughs> up. Uh, features a ton of your artwork. Uh, but that was published in early 1996, and yep. knowing how long the publishing cycle is, you w would have had to be doing that uh, as you were starting up in 94 or possibly even before. So how did that work, which featured a lot of ships that maybe had been represented visually in Star Wars before, mm -hmm. the A-9 Interceptor, the Sea Ruth, things like that. How did that inform your journey towards discovering Star Wars design? Yeah, a little bit of both. I actually started working on that after I got hired for episode one. But I, you know, there was actually a couple months um, before I started doing episode one. And so I was contacted by a publisher to do this book. And it was really funny because I felt that it was a warm up to my actual job, because a lot of those are classic designs, they're designs in other stories and in comic books. And so it was really, it was a good primer for me, because by the time I finished that book, you know, I felt that I was ready. And that's where, you know, when I started day one on episode one, um, that when George kind of, you know, upended the whole <laughs> sort of design brief, it completely threw me. So, but it was really fun to do that book, because it was, again, drawing some of the classic designs that I've always liked. Thank you. Right here. Greg from Aurora, Illinois. Um, in the Galaxy Edge panel, you mentioned how the planets reflect the characters involved with them. Um, with Naboo and Coruscant and the new like looks at Tatooine that Phantom Menace gave us, mm -hmm. what elements do you think like really you know were cool depictions of the characters as you know? Uh, how the planet represented them. Yeah, for Batu. yeah. No, it was, it was really fun, because I mean, in that part of that design process, uh, we were trying to figure out a, 
a new place, but that still fit really well into the Star Wars universe. And Star Wars worlds, as you know, are, are almost like one geology, you know, whether it's a snow planet, a forest planet, or a water planet. And we've kind of gone through all of them now in terms of all of our films, and it's hard to find something that's really fresh. And we were very fortunate in that doing our research, uh, we found these wonderful petrified trees uh, in, in, you know, in the south. And they were, they were amazing in the sense that they were very strong graphically. And so what we decided to do was just take that idea and you know, transform it and make it uh, you know, 100 times bigger, just change the scale on it, and make the planet worldwide of a petrified forest. And what worked really well was that it graphically it gave this planet a real strong, distinct identity. But then it also reflected the idea that the people that were on this planet had a long history over many, many hundreds of years. And that was what we wanted was that the, the but two itself had to have a very eclectic mix of a foundation of a city that's been there for a long time. So when you see the designs of both the natural formations plus the uh, sort of the artificial village itself, you can see all the layers of all the previous people that have been there. And I think that's where when you go to Galaxy's Edge, you'll be hopefully pleasantly surprised by the richness that we put in there. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for that. Unfortunately, we are out of time. We're out of time with Doug Chang. So okay. thank you very much to all of you for coming. Please give a round of okay. applause to Doug Chang. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have a great day at Star Wars Celebration. We'll see you again soon.